I have a sister. Yeah, she lives in North Carolina. She's a nurse. Older, younger. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's coming out. Yeah. Hopefully not. Yeah, not that type. Yeah, lucky for her. Seminar speaker who is Dr. William Kendall from the University, uh, sorry, Colorado State University. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology, and also an assistant unit leader of the Colorado Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. He did his master's degree at the University of Cincinnati, and then he earned two master's degrees, including one in statistics and then a PhD all at the uh, North Carolina State University. Yeah. <laughs> he spent about five years with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Division of Migratory Birds, and then 14 years with Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in Maryland before coming to Colorado State University. And a lot of you probably know he's been a leader in the development of marker capture models and all their various extensions and elaborations. Um, I tried to count up the number of publications on his CV and I got cross-eyed and lost count because I'm not as quantitative as him, but uh, it looks like he's closing in on 90 or more peer-reviewed research publications and dozens of technical publications. Um, so he's been really productive and has been able to apply his ecological know-how and his quantitative skills to a wide variety of questions in a wide variety of systems. So please join me in thanking and welcoming Dr. William Kendall. Thanks, Carl. Uh, very nice introduction. And thanks to uh, to the university, to the department for inviting me in. I think it's great that you have this uh, series of seminars that are funded to bring people in, and especially that the students are involved in choosing that. It's something that we're just starting to to get uh, at CSU. We don't we don't have the money to bring in speakers, but I think it's great. And thanks for the invitation to give a talk. Um, I decided to. Uh, so a lot of the time I spend is on, as very well said, elaboration of methods and things like market capture and occupancy. Uh, it would be pretty boring to just talk about those methods. So I wanted to weave it around uh, some work I do, <clears throat> have been doing off and on, not with much money, over the last 15 years, 18, 19 years, I guess, on uh, sea turtles. So the talk will be about sea turtles a bit, but I'm not a an extreme sea turtle expert. Um, uh, it'll be a bit about market capture approaches to mo uh, modeling and inference and some combinations of those things. So the uh, 
I will give acknowledgments at the end, but this is uh, the things I'm going to be presenting, of course, are uh, from a, a strong collaboration, not only with uh, colleagues such as Gary White to help implement these models in user-friendly software, but with uh, various sea turtle uh, biologists uh, who generate these questions and, and uh, are uh, tightly involved in all of this. So I'll start with a general background on sea turtles. Um, just to give a, a little bit of a background, uh, the big picture, and then quickly dial down to uh, two study populations I'm involved with. I have gotten myself involved with a number of different sea turtle uh, studies in terms of design of, of this data collection and how it can be done. Then I'll talk about this approach to modeling not only vital rates like survival and breeding probability from these uh, nesting populations, but also uh, parameters associated with phenology of nesting uh, to see if that shifts over time uh, in the face of imperfect detection using this multi-state open robust design market capture framework. Then I'll talk about analysis for the uh, two study populations and the results and some conclusions. Okay, there's six, uh, seven uh, species of sea turtles. Uh, the largest being the leatherback, the smallest being the hawksbill, and those will be the two uh, that I'm talking about today. Um, the other species, they're all uh, listed under the Endangered Species Act, except the flatback, which is an Australian uh, turtle and uh, not under the purview, I guess, of, of the ESA. So I'll be talking about the largest of the sea turtles and the smallest of the sea turtles, located fairly close to one another. Threats to sea turtles in general. And the interest, my, uh, the studies that I'm involved with interest is in population monitoring for one thing to see what the status is of sea turtles as well as some of their life history uh, questions. The general threats include take, both incidental uh, bycatch type take either in shrimp trawlers off the U.S., or artisanal fisheries off of Trinidad, these kinds of things. And there still is intentional harvest of these species, whether legally or illegally, uh, on the beaches or other places. Also, on the beach conditions, uh, there are predators uh, of, that either will take hatchlings or dig up nests, um, as well as light, things like lighting that distract uh, the hatchlings, turn them in the wrong direction. Pollution, especially things like plastic bags, are a threat to things like a leatherback, which eats jellyfish, it confuses a bag with uh, or jellyfish, and things like climate change, which could sea level rise could inundate beaches. It also can raise temperatures, which pushes the sex ratio to skew more and more toward females, being uh, temperature dependent sex determination. So those are general threats that uh, they face. And the challenge is anybody who's worked with long lived populations, long lived uh, species. The challenge is in trying to monitor and therefore mo and thereby model uh, these populations. The uh, sea turtles, extremely complex life history and very hard to track uh, for most of its life stages. A lot of these life stages are protracted. The ones that are most accessible are uh, the, uh, the breeders. This is from Cross Crowder and Caswell, the classic uh, citation for matrix modeling. Um, back in 1987, and they identified seven life stages they were interested in, but with very little uh, data. With which to parameterize, to estimate the parameters of these models. But they did identify three classes of breeding, uh, 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 three different breeding states uh, that they thought was uh, meaningful to to model, and we will talk about some of that, uh, trying to parameterize that part of the model. The two populations I'll be talking about today are uh, Jumbie Bay, Hawksbill Project, uh, off of the island, a uh, small privately owned island off of Antigua, which I'll show a little more detail in a second as well as the Leatherback Sea Turtle Project at, on St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands at the Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge. So these are both long-term uh, what's called saturation tagging projects that attempt to get every turtle 
that comes up on the beach, you'll see from the results of the analysis that uh, they come pretty close, at least the once in a season. And this is the picture of the larger uh, Caribbean with Puerto Rico being here, and uh, these are in the leeward islands of the Caribbean here. The lar a bigger picture um, of the Caribbean, this just to illustrate part of the difficulty of uh, not only catching them when they're not on the nesting beach, but also trying to associate the nesting beach with other parts of the annual cycle in order to perhaps model uh, the population dynamics as a function of an environmental covariance. And this is a process, uh, process of identifying these foraging areas has been going on for a while using stable isotopes and genetics. But the two populations I'm going to talk about today that hasn't been done reliably enough to actually try to get environmental covariates as predictors of the, type of the parameters I'll be talking about. But the leatherbacks there at uh, St. Croix uh, will move up into the North Atlantic. And the next slide will show a bigger picture of that. Um, feeding off of Canada. The, uh, the little data they have so far on this population of hawksbills is that they uh, forage in the Western Caribbean uh, over more toward uh, Central America. So it's still trying to nail down some of that. This is a larger picture of leatherback migration. They feed a lot right up here uh, off of Canada. Again, their main uh, prey is the jellyfish. This identifies the breeding populations. Uh, the ones we're talking about are right here. The larger populations of leatherbacks are on the uh, South American coast and Trinidad, the largest nesting beach in the world for uh, leatherback is uh, on Trinidad. Uh, French Guiana, Suriname, those are all large populations and harder to, uh, to monitor. The, the population I'll be talking about today is fairly self-contained and easier to access. This is the uh, St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands with uh, Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge over here. Uh, just, I'll briefly mention this other, uh, in comparison later, there's a Hawksville project going on here at Buck Island Reef National Monument, uh, another intensive tagging program by the National Park Service. So there are these various populations within the Caribbean and also around the world that do have fairly intensive tagging programs going on. Not much in the way of analyzing those data, uh, at least for demography um, to be. And so uh, the leatherback study is over here at Sandy Point. And I included this picture to show you uh, the beach here. There's like three kilometers of beach that they, they uh, patrol. It's fairly wide, a leatherback so heavy, it doesn't go very high above the tide line before it lays its eggs. Um, and therefore, it tends to distribute its eggs from nest to nest over a wider range of areas. So it doesn't go too far up above that tide line, high tide line. This is uh, Long Island off of the coast of Antigua. It's, these are all super rich people in these houses here. The project is funded by the Homeowners Association. <laughs> you think they'd be rolling in the bucks, but it's not a very big budget. Um, the main study area is Pasture Bay along in here, but they will, as much as possible, patrol these other areas. Uh, some parts the homeowners don't want them in. Uh, just depends on the homeowner. This is uh, Pasture Bay here. I haven't been there myself, unfortunately. Um, but a hawksbill will actually go up into the vegetation to nest. Uh, I don't know enough about it, whether that is a strategy of cover or whether it's just getting far enough above the, um, the high tide line to minimize the risk of inundation. <clears throat> so the Jumbie Bay project uh, started in 1987, so this will be a 25-year data set that I'll be presenting. Um, the, uh, the primary study beaches is Pasture Bay, but they also survey others as well. The survey season is June to November. The protocols are hourly patrols. <laughs> they tag every turtle they can find. With a sea turtle, you have to kind of wait until it goes all of us into a kind of a trance before uh, you can even approach, at least the hawksbill, before you can approach them. Otherwise, you'll scare them back into the, the uh, water. 
they tend to lay about 140 eggs. Uh, they, uh, for this particular species, the tagging method is flipper tags, but also drilling uh, some of the scoots of a shell uh, in a unique pattern. And that's what, in my mind, as an analyst, makes it a reliable tagging method. Uh, flipper tags come out pretty easily. Uh, but the, the drilling, unique drilling pattern is, is uh, pretty reliable. And they'll, they'll do measurements like uh, characters length and things like that. On the Sandy Point project, it was initiated in 1977. Systematic tagging beginning in 1981. Pit tagging beginning in 1992. And this is where our time series will start, where the more reliable tagging is. But also this allows us to know uh, more reliably uh, that a new uh, turtle after that 1992 newly caught turtle is likely a neophyte or first time nester. And we'll be talking about models that distinguish that from remigrants or experienced nesters. The, uh, uh, the season is from March to September, although sometimes it's shorter than that. Uh, this is a night, uh, most I think is done at night, although there is some effort during the day. And uh, this is the three kilometers of beach that they patrol. These uh, say now that both of these populations are well protected, at least from the nesting perspective. There is no poaching uh, at either of these places, which is not true in other parts of the Caribbean. There is no uh, artisanal fishery just off the coast that, that traps these turtles into their nets. Um, they're exposed to the same threats as the other populations all the way from there. So these become kind of a benchmark uh, for background vital rates for uh, species. So three kilometers of beach, uh, mostly nightly patrolled, but it could be daily. Each uh, turtle uh, gets flipper tags, but then a the more reliable tag is the pit tag. Um, <coughs> and they also measure things, things like carapace length. The parameters of interest um, are, are numerous uh, from these tagging studies. Between years, it interested in survival, whether there's transients, whether some initially, initially caught uh, turtles actually are transients and aren't going to come back. Uh, is survival stable over time? You would expect so with these long-lived species. Remigration or conditional breeding probability. Is there an effect of the number of years since the last nest? If the turtle is supposed to be an energy accumulation. Archie Carr proposed uh, back in the 70s. Therefore, you would expect that the the longer they wait, the, 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 uh, the higher the probability they come back the next time. Then is there a neophyte effect or an experience effect on that uh, breeding probability? Uh, this was generated by Jim Richardson who ran the Hawksville project, more of an experience thing. But the other question here is um, if uh, reptiles will sometimes put, continue to put energy into growth after they start to breed, then you would expect that the energy they're putting into finishing up their growth to uh, impede the energy accumulation, and therefore they would nest less often. Within each year, we're interested in abundance and that change over time, not only of the number of nesters, but the total adult females, both those nesting and those skipping nesting. Clutch frequency is the expected number of clutches laid per turtle in a year. And then nesting phenology, uh, not only the relative intensity of use or probability of presence of a turtle, as the season goes on and whether that shifts over time, but also uh, expected arrival dates, expected departure dates. Uh, depending on the particular question being asked, uh, any of these uh, parameters could be of interest. All right, so given these general, this general interest in demography and phenology, given that this is uh, nightly or day, uh, uh, patrols, basically daily captures, uh, Hawksbill tends to come back every 14 days, a leatherback every nine days. Dividing the, the data into intervals of, of nine or 14 days, you hope to get a chance to see a turtle each time, each time it comes up, maybe missing her. To analyze these data, we developed this uh, multi-state robust design market capture method, which is why I spent a lot of time on, so I'll spend a little time on it now. Um, the idea here is that you have multiple states of interest. This is more generic, state A and state B. Uh, that within, you're interested in how the population changes over time with respect to survival. And the side parameter is the probability of transitioning from one state to the next. 
breeder to skip breeder, skip breeder back to breeder, neophyte uh, breeder to experienced breeder. Within each season, uh, there are multiple sampling occasions. In this case, it's the 14-day intervals or 9-day intervals. Uh, each time an animal that's there is exposed to that capture effort. With this kind of framework, uh, there's a few things we can do um, in terms of uh, estimating these parameters, increasing precision in parameters, etc. From this collection of, of uh, sampling, each one of these have an individual detection probability, we can estimate the overall probability of catching an animal at least once in a season, given that it's there. So that's the essence of, of the parameters of uh, the cross year parameters of this model. The open robust design, there's different versions of this type of model, simply means that arrivals and departures to and from the study area are staggered in time, that not everyone is there for the whole field season. Okay, and this is certainly true for the sea turtle, it's true for uh, spring migrating birds, it's true for uh, uh, certain fish systems is true for a lot of systems. Under this idea here, this goes back to a paper we did in 2001, and this larger, all these, these approaches I'm going to talk about today, I'm still trying to get, it's been in mark for a while, but uh, still getting it uh, together for publication. The assumption is, this is, a, this is one field season, the assumption is the the dynamics are going on between field seasons, these transition probabilities, in this case it would be breeding probability decisions, and the survival process is going on between field seasons. And then within a field season, we model <coughs> arrival probabilities. And then given the animal arrives, what's the probability is detected? And then it could just stay once and for a sea turtle could lay just one clutch of eggs and be gone. So a certain departure probability. And we have that throughout. Okay, so now we have a set of within season parameters that will help us estimate the overall detection probability, but also estimate some season parameters associated with phenology and clutch size. I'm oh, sorry, uh, clutch frequency. Uh, this model is implemented in MARC. Uh, in that case, the entry probability is called PN, uh, and this, uh, these, these entry probabilities add to one. So the, uh, in uh, MARC, instead of a departure probability, it's actually a persistence probability phi, uh, probability of staying around for another sample period. The probability of, of, of sea turtle <coughs> lay, stays around to lay another clutch of eggs. And this parameter can be modeled as a function of time within the season or a function of a number of sampling periods since arrival, which for a sea troll means the number of nests laid so far, which makes sense that that uh, number of nests, the probability of laying another clutch of eggs is going to be a function of how many clutches we've already been laid. I don't want to, I'm not trying to get into details of all this, um, but the Parameters that are derived from these model parameters, uh, in this case, the expected residence time under one method is simply a weighted average of the number of nests of clutches laid, with the weights being these combination of these probabilities arrival and departure. Okay, so these are the parameters of the model, and we can derive the residence time or number of clutches laid from these parameters. Uh, if the departure is a function of how long you've been there, then it's a little simpler calculation. But again, it's another, it's just a weighted average with, uh, as a function of those parameters. The overall probability of being detected at least once is even uglier, but uh, nevertheless, again, just a function of the natural parameters of the model. And, that, and Mark, uh, you have two options in dealing with it, either through maximum likelihood or through MCMC uh, -MC approaches. In terms of abundance, uh, the number of nesters is just the number you captured divided by the probability of being captured at least once. That's a common approach to uh, estimating abundance. 
to estimate the superpopulation, including nesters and skip nesters, this uh, this probably this uh, number of total number of turtles is derived from this ex this difference equation of the number of uh, nesters next year being a function of those that uh, survived and stayed around from nesting last year, those that skipped nesting and came back plus new recruits. So from that we <coughs> we estimate. Uh, the total number of uh, nesters in this particular case for these sea turtles, this is the most difficult part to deal with in all this. Uh, the others you can get from the actual uh, modeling process. And uh, because detection probability ends up being so high, we assume that we know the number of recruits for this particular analysis. And finally, these phenology parameters one is this intensity uh, or the proportion of breeders available. Uh, I'm sorry, it should be at the sampling period, uh, at a given sampling period. And again, it's a function of those arrival probabilities and, and uh, persistence probabilities. And then expected arrival period, expected departure period. So under this approach, the modeling is being done for the fees and the fees, and everything else is derived, instead of assuming some kind of distribution on the arrival process. Some people will directly model the arrival or departure process. Okay, so that's the model structure, the general uh, modeling approach. Again, um, you can apply to a lot of different species. Whales is another one we've applied it to, um, depending on the questions you might ask. But given this modeling uh, approach, now the model structures uh, that we considered. Sorry. Um, we consider a couple of uh, this for the remigration hypotheses. We have these specific questions. Uh, again, under this energy accumulation uh, hypothesis, pre-migration probability or breeding probability should be increasing with each year you skip. Um, under the idea of individual variability, where there are some efficient and some inefficient breeders, uh, going back to papers like Nichols in, 2000, in 1994, uh, you expect the probability of breeding, given that you skipped last year, to be less um, just because you're not as good at breeding. This is the model we set up. Um, anyone's run market capture models with multi-state to do 10 model, 10 states seems daunting and how much data do you really need for that? Um, well, this, but it turns out to be not that many parameters after all. So there's two observable states here, the nesters, the neophyte nesters and re-migrant experienced nesters. Everything else is a skip nesting state and is unobservable. You can't catch them if they're you're on the beach and they're not. Um, what they do, these are transitory states going from skip, if you're a neophyte, you skip one, skip two, skip three, and then uh, finally uh, uh, skip four or more, and therefore you can recycle. Once they breed, they go back, they, now they're a remigrant or experienced nester, and they go to this skip one, skip two, skip three. Okay? So uh, when you put all this in, it's ugly, but it ends up being. Um, not as many parameters as the first thought. Um, the other thing is for this, the Hawksville sea turtle, they'll go to this state or this state reliably because they don't skip, they don't nest two years in a row. And the leatherbacks do at a very low rate. These are the parameter effects we consider in these analyses. For this should be, uh, that's the entry probability, I'm sorry, it should be E instead of beta. Um, different effects like state differences, time, Quadratic effects, a good a priori model for arrival of sea turtles when they, if you have a, a heart of your nesting season as a quadratic pattern in arrival. Um, the, uh, for the uh, persistence probability time, time since arrival or number of uh, uh, touches laid for detection, state dependence or uh, time. For survival, we considered time this transient effect, and the, the people who run that project felt that in 2002, because of the, the density of the population really growing, that maybe some of them were going, were, were not hanging around or going other places to breed. So we had specific hypotheses about whether there was transients before or after the year 2000. And then on the breeding probability, there were times since 
number of years since nesting, uh, being limited to just one, uh, or the full model of four, uh, et cetera, and then whether or not there's a distinction between neophyte and remigrate nesters. In terms of results for hawks and bills, uh, these, these tables are always hard to read. Uh, this is the, uh, with robust design, there's so many potential models because you have cross year, within year, it's a huge number of potential models. My approach is to model the within season data first, see if there's some common model structure that makes sense, um, and then use that model structure in the cross year analysis. Okay, and so uh, again, there's betas there instead of the E's, but those are entry probabilities. Uh, so you can see here that the top model had a quadratic effect on arrival time, a uh, quadratic effect of, top, of number of nests laid to date on uh, persistence, and that detection within the season was constant. <coughs> I had a, uh, I apologize, I grabbed the wrong uh, file, the wrong. Uh, these are relative weights instead of the actual weights. Uh, but the um, a common model that came out throughout is this quadratic effect of entry probability, this quadratic uh, time since arrival on fee, and constant detection. At the level of sampling their, their, their uh, sampling effort going on, this is not surprising at all, and this is uh, what I would have expected a priori. And what I also did here was say, um, so there's the effective capture probability for the season. You see how high that is. So their claim of saturation tagging is pretty realized. You know, the lowest one there is 94%. You could model all this with a detection probability of one and do about the same. Um, what I did was I compared it within each year, because each year had a bunch of models run. I compared this P star, the best model, against the model average, and then this common model structure here. And you see it's very comp comparable throughout. So I'm comfortable taking this model structure and using it in the cross-year analysis. This is the cross-year analysis. Um, yeah, now that my weights are correct. Uh, the, it is, the weight is spread out over a few models. So when you look at it, uh, there does seem to be in that model structure going out three skip years uh, as meaningful in terms of changes in, in Subsequent breeding probability was meaningful. Uh, the neophyte versus free migrant was not as strong. Okay, it's, it's in some of the top models, but not all of them. Um, and then this transient effect before and after 2000 is also uh, strong in this analysis. So here is the, uh, the trajectory and population size. Uh, this is the uh, overall number of nesters. It's done two different ways through. Uh, uh, maximum likelihood approach, and then this MCMC approach. And the reason we use the MCMC approach is that the uh, superpopulation size is not a model that's hardwired into MARC, and so we had to derive it after the fact. And in order to get the, uh, the confidence intervals on that derived parameter, we used MCMC um, and post-process the data, the posterior uh, distributions <clears throat> of the estimates to get these uh, error bars. And because there's a little bit of an inconsistency between the maximum likelihood and the MCMC, we, we put both trajectories in. But anyway, you can see that the population has been rising consistently. You can also see that this is not a huge population. Okay, so uh, one reason that these models work is the very high detection probability. If these were small detection probabilities, there'd be very little data here to deal with. But it is a growing population. Oops. This is the breaking out the, uh, the nesting numbers by uh, neophytes versus remigrants. Uh, you see the little dip at the end here. You also see that there are error bars there. They're just very tight. They're confidence intervals. Again, the detection is so high <coughs> that it's, uh, they see just about every one. Okay, so there's a little dip at the end, but overall, uh, uh, a lot of uh, growth. Even after 2000, when they noticed they were getting awfully dense, and other, and they thought that uh, turtles were going elsewhere, you still get this growth going on. But you also see evidence for that transience. 
the estimate for survival is 94% uh, for remigrants and for neophytes before 2000. Okay, this is, uh, in my experience, this 94 seems to be magical. I work on sandhill cranes, adult survival is 94. I work on albatross, adult survival is 94. Um, I work on manatees, adult survival is 96. Uh, and actually, uh, that Buck Island, we've analyzed Buck Island's data, and it's 94. Uh, for the, after 2000, the apparent survival for neophytes is 78% of the standard error. And so, in the, uh, given that that's a function of transients as well as uh, a transient process, it turns out that about 16% of neophytes after 2000 are dispersed, or they're not coming back, according to this. So, there is some dispersion. They are starting to see more turtles, including mark turtles, that are on in Tiba, the main island of Tiba. This is a bit ugly, um, but this is the uh, remigration or breeding probability. You notice the, we analyzed the first 10 years of data in um, our 2001 paper, and there was a decline, which you can see as, as uh, either recovered or partially recovered. It could very well just be part of a long-term cycle. So even 25 years of data for a sea turtle is not a lot of data. Uh, but uh, the, the highest probability of, uh, well, the, let me see. The, um, the first neophyte, uh, the probability of coming back is the uh, is the lowest, uh, and the first, if they skip one year after nesting, the probability of coming back for the remigrants is a little higher than the neophyte, but not strongly so. Remember that effect wasn't very strong, but it is higher. And then for the uh, NS2 or RS2, those are actually the highest. The highest is the Remigrants who skip two, but if they skip three, it actually atten attenuates or goes down a bit. So it, there is an increase in the probability of nesting as you skip years, but that either attenuates or goes away. And without actually modeling individual variability directly, I just kind of say you're starting to clear out the best nesters, and uh, what's left is those who aren't as efficient. We do want to get into individual variability. The expected uh, clutch frequency. It's not very different, mostly, for neophytes versus remigrants. Um, it, does, it does look like it's uh, maybe a slight going, going down just a little bit over time. But it's around uh, four to five uh, per, uh, per individual per year. You'll, find, you'll see with the leatherbacks that they reproduce at a higher rate. Uh, sorry, a uh, larger number of nests per year. We also see the neophyte uh, air bars are, are quite a bit larger. There are fewer of them. This is this is intensity. What's the probability that a, a given individual is there at any point in the season? And you can see uh, these are more for visual purposes. Um, uh, you can see kind of a cohort effect here that. Uh, you know, it's a little later in the season here, a little earlier, more spread out here. Same pattern here and here. This looks similar. And then it starts to change as you go along. Uh, but really, uh, this parameter is supplied sort of for, for visualizing. Um, if you see extreme shifts, you, you might be able to see it. Um, this is later in the year, uh, later in the time series. Um, uh, things change a little bit over time. But it's very, it's hard to see with this particular statistic here. We look though at, at expected uh, arrival times or dates and expected departure dates. So the, effect, the mean arrival date starts is like in the August here. Um, again, didn't try to put a trend on this, but you can see it maybe a slight decline over time. Uh, same thing with the departure date. Uh, slight, uh, maybe a slight decline, maybe a shift earlier in the season. Uh, not trying to make a big deal of it, um, just providing a, a, an approach to to examining, uh, looking for shifts in phenology over time. <clears throat> so, with respect to the hawksbills, um, the survival of 94% is consistent with the Buck Island turtles. The other hawksbill populations really haven't been uh, analyzed uh, in an effective way. 
in terms of breeding probability, uh, after skipping three years, the increase in probability of subsequent breeding attenuates a bit. Um, the neophyte effect is weak. Uh, and uh, the, the decline that was seen in the first 10 to 12 years uh, is either partially or fully. Uh, and I put recoveries in quotes because, again, if it's just part of a cycle, it's not a matter of really recovery, it's just a cycle. Uh, in terms of the phenology, perhaps a subtle shift in breeding uh, to earlier dates. So this analysis will be hopefully uh, submitted as a kind of a combination methods paper and analysis paper of ecology soon. Um, in terms of leatherbacks, the um, for the within season, uh, more of a mixture. Uh, for these uh, parameters, it, within season analysis aren't really being used uh, for this part of it. Uh, T is a, a linear trend in, um, in detection. I'm oh, sorry, in, in entry probability. These are two different papers. Uh, but a distinction between neophytes and migrants. Um, detection is a function of effort. So they do collect effort data in this particular study. And it, it was the, the, my, the major predictor. So the most common chosen model structure in this collection of years, this is 1992 to 13, 22 years. Quadratic trend and a neophyte new migrant distinction and entry probability, a linear trend over time, not time since arrival, um, and a neophyte new migrant distinction in persistence and capture probability as a function of effort. And again, the P star, the, the effective detection probability is not always as high as it was with the hospitals. Uh, but still very high. This is the uh, function of, uh, on an individual nine day basis, detection probability was uh, more in the 70s, up to 80 perhaps, whereas it was in the low 90s on a per 14 day basis for the oxygen. Now, uh, taking the full robust design uh, structure, um, the, uh, the dominant models had transients in survival. Uh, the, this, throughout, you see the distinction between neophytes and remigrants. Uh, but the time since last nesting effect was not as strong here. Really, the, the predominantly, the, uh, most of the weight went to just, they skip, they, they just about always skip one year. Um, then there's a, uh, uh, Probably them coming back the next, uh, coming back after that is the same no matter how many years under that model. So it's, it's kind of the opposite. The neophyte effect was weak with the oxbills, strong here, but the time since nesting was stronger with the oxbills. Uh, this is the nester abundance, neophytes and remigrants. This is a little larger population, but still not real huge, and it's a good thing they have such high detection probability. Down in Trinidad, it would be a, like a Population of over a thousand, but much uh, lower detection because of the number of turtles there. And the population has grown. There was one paper published in 2001 pointing out this growth, but that growth seems to have stabilized, and that's a little clearer <clears throat> when you look at the now the neophyte and remigrants combined in terms of nesting. When you look at the superpopulation size, you can see it stabilizing at that point. Leather, uh, sea turtles in general are doing much better in the Caribbean than they are in the Pacific. Uh, leatherbacks in the Pacific are tanking. So, we did, uh, Peter Dutton with NOAA suggested we take this neophyte and migrant effect farther, saying, well, if, it's, uh, if it were, there's a distinction between when they're a new nester and they come back the next time, what if that experience actually uh, matters even as they gather more experience, or perhaps as they grow? Uh, more from uh, being a neophyte. So now we managed to get a 20 state model into this. But again, these are transitory states. Um, number of parameters is, again, not as large as you might think. Here, that, uh, the bottom line of this is that, yes, this models with this full distinction, comparing against models that dropped out some of these, uh, these levels, uh, the full distinction uh, indeed did best. 
the overall survival of a leatherback is not as great as a um, as a hawk's bill. And when I've seen I've seen results even a little lower than this in previous papers on leatherbacks, and thought, ah, that's a transient issue. That's a uh, 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 um, it's a transient issue, it's a tag loss issue, but in fact, in these things, the other pit tags, they, they get them back you know, very reliably, and it just seems like the leatherback has a lower background survival rate than, uh, than the hawk's bill. The, uh, for the neophytes, the apparent survival is 82, which means about 99% of the neophyte nesters in general don't return. This is uh, this uh, distinction for the uh, new nesters. <coughs> uh, this is skipping one uh, nesters that new nesters that skip one, and then come back the first time, come back the second time, third time, and more. And so you get the same pattern. These are additive effect models. You get the same uh, effect that the not that the probability of uh, uh, nesting increases with experience. These down here, that's the probability that a nester comes back for the next year. So it's very, very low. There are only 15 turtles total that came back to years in a row. I don't have the uh, expected arrival times or the um, departure times or that intensity parameter here. My student had a baby, or my uh, helper had a baby. Um, that had to take priority. Uh, this is, uh, but these are plots over. Uh, Years for neophytes and remigrants, basic remigrants, um, and you can see that the remigrants tend to come earlier than the neophytes do. And uh, a little bit subtle, but that the, I just have part of this to show that the neophytes, a little subtle, but they tend to leave earlier as well. And so that translates into a higher uh, clutch frequency. For, uh, you know, for remigrants than for, uh, for, neo, yeah, for remigrants rather than neophytes. So not only do they come back more often, but they tend to lay more clutches when they do. Now this could be, well this is a function of putting effort into growth even after you start breeding. It could be also that there's an increasing fidelity to this beach over time and experience. The only way to really sort that out is to have lots of people in lots of places or manage to get telemetry on a turtle that lasts more than a year. They get knocked off by the males. They don't, they don't tend to carry a transmitter for more than a year. So um, sorting this out would be difficult. But for now, the neophytes uh, have low reproductive output. This was uh, taken a little further and looking at the um, a new nester versus, um, so this is a neophyte, and this is a function of years since uh, first capture. So there's a neophyte that's zero years since first capture, because it's a neophyte. And it goes up from there. And so this is uh, all turtles that skipped one year before they came back. Um, they didn't come back right away. There was one for those who came back right away, but the air bars are so huge because there are 15 of them. And you can see that there's not a lot of difference between those who skip one and skip two. But it does tend to increase uh, with uh, years since first capture and then attenuates here. I'm not sure what's going on with the ones that skip three or more years. Uh, I'm not really sure what's going on with that. But this just kind of reinforces the neophyte being the smaller uh, clutch size. Clutch frequency, sorry. Okay, so in terms of leatherback conclusions, um, Survival of 90% is the highest reported for leatherbacks uh, to date, and maybe the background survival, given that they um, they lay, you know, instead of uh, four to five, they lay six to to eight to ten uh, clutches. Maybe the difference. This is where you really need to get more information on the whole life history uh, to to make where it all makes sense. Because this is a population that is increasing to stable. Uh, in terms of breeding probability, the effective year since last nesting uh, uh, is, is limited for, for breeding, but strong for clutch frequency. And the effective experience or years since first nesting uh, has a strong uh, significance for breeding and clutch frequency. 
So uh, that's a combination of a, an approach to dealing with these type of data and these types of questions. A little bit about sea turtles. I want to acknowledge a lot of people. Uh, Kristen Pearson is the person doing the heavy lifting on cranking these things out. Gary Wade implemented this stuff and Mark Forming on the Jumbie Bay project. Uh, this started by Jim Richardson, University of Georgia, and currently run by Seth Stapleton. Lots of uh, funder, the funder and lots of technicians. Sandy Point, Leatherback, Bobby Lombard with Fish and Wildlife Service, Peter and Kel Kelly with NOAA. Dan Valerilis is a, a, a contractor and the Earthwatch volunteers. And I, well, I have Buck Island Sea Turtle Research Program uh, just to acknowledge that, that comparison with their uh, survival. So, questions? We've got plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Um, so considering that most of these turtle species are on the endangered species list, it seems like understanding their true survival would be a really important factor. Um, since these models just do apparent survival, is there any way to try to tease that out a little bit more, or do you assume that site fidelity is really high, or? Um, yeah, now I, I put a parent to kind of contrast the re-migrant with the first time, but it still is a parent. And the only way in general with these things to uh, uh, to get, tr to claim true survival is to claim that you have universal sampling. So with, the, with uh, ducks, we use band recoveries and claim that no matter where a duck is, it could die to, to a hunter's gun sometime in the annual cycle. Um, so there's models that assume that, but that's the only way to do it, right? Um, if you had lots of money for telemetry to see where else they might go, uh, I think, uh, well, with the sea turtle matrix model, because you don't have really good data on those other uh, life stages, who knows what it is? I know with cranes, that 94% survival basically made the trajectory of cranes make sense. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's what you would need to do to really claim. But when I used a parent, I was using it mainly to, to deal with that transient issue. Right, so do you have any ideas on like them going to different areas, like breeding on different beaches as opposed to coming back? Yeah, well, that's a good point. Hawksbills don't have a reputation for doing that. Um, and with a, when your systematic sampling of turtles is so scattered, if they did go some, especially hawksbills, because they don't nest in concentration. Leatherbacks have a huge reputation for doing that, but not here. They do find them at Colebra, um, which I think is an island off of Puerto Rico, and there is a study going on there. Um, so that could be, uh, th this population of leatherbacks seems to be a little different than the others. Uh, I think that, um, there's where tele short-term telemetry can certainly work. Um, the other thing, uh, I'm trying to extend these models to deal with within season availability. That's not completely random. If they're just flitting in and off of your beach, then all, all you're affecting is the precision of detection. Because now your detection is a function of availability and detection. But if that's a Markov process, then there's some bias going on. And there, are, there actually are ways with sea turtles, they do complete nest counts in the morning. So if you are, know how many turtles nested in a nine-day period, and you know how many you caught in that nine-day period, you know what you, your true detection is for that nine-day period. So it, it, that could be used to indirectly. But there's also issues like there's a population on the Gulf Coast uh, where it seems like they use a particular beach early in their season, and then they go somewhere else, like they move down the coast. And you'll never track that, maybe for survival, you'll never track that reliably because they're not having a chance to come back to you. If they flit in and out, you're okay. You know what I mean? So yeah, there are a lot of complications. But telemetry is one, um, and uh, dead recoveries would be another. Yeah. Is there any sort of genetic variation in the sampling program going on to do parentage-based tagging? Does that even work since you probably don't keep your hands on males? Uh, there is, actually. Brian uh, Erton, Chamberlain at the University of Georgia did a really nice dissertation by trying to sample every loggerhead nest north of the Florida border. 
just about did. I don't know, you have 10,000 samples or something. Uh, you got permission to sacrifice these eggs. But he was he's a population geneticist, which is typical of sea turtles. They're tagging these things, they're not asking the demography questions, right? But they're collecting really good data. There's a there's that's like a, a poster child example of how you do a robust design, but they didn't have that much. But um, he gets maternal DNA, paternal DNA, and then he does the parentage stuff and now are getting into the population genetics of that. Would that be an approach for getting it? Uh, movement rates among populations, since you would be well, at some at some, some temporal scale, scale, right? Yeah. At some temporal scale, for sure. Um, I don't know enough. About, I don't think it's at the scale we're talking about. But um, uh, there are they have used genetics for um, natal location, um, but uh, but genetic. Fingerprinting is another less labor-intensive but more lab-intensive approach to sampling. You don't have to have crews out all night. Some of these beaches are dangerous. In Barbados, they can do it outside the Hilton, but not in other parts of the island. Um, so picking up a turtle nest, because they all, they all, their their protocol is to dig in to confirm a nest is there in the morning. So they see a crawl. It could be a false crawl. And so they'll dig in to confirm. So if you allow them to take an egg, um, there's lots of I'm. Uh, we've been proposing designing an integrated monitoring program for loggerheads on the, the whole uh, southeast, um, where the combination of counts some places and actual vital rates of other places. What's the best combination? Do whatever. The, the other trouble is it's an endangered species, but there's no particular management actions that are being vetted a lot of times. So if you're trying to design monitoring to inform management, you need management questions. There are there are ESA decisions. Other yeah. So you mentioned how climate change might be impacting the sex ratios. Could that influence your abundance estimates? Like there might be more females, so they might be nesting more than before, just based on how many eggs you have. Oh sorry, the last part of it I didn't hear. No. Oh, I'm just wondering. Climate change effect abundance. Yeah. Aspects? So yeah, could, could they influence it by there being a lot more females, so then there might be more nesting. Do you think? Oh, I see. Probably assume that there's a certain ratio of um, females and males for overall. I see what you mean. Yeah, the nesting population is going up, uh, but the number of males might be going down. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about their how many males do you need, Other, and for genetic diversity, but encounter. I don't know how many. I know there's multiple parentage. There might be multiple parentage within clutches, but I'm not positive of that. I know there's multiple parentage across the clutches. Um, this is where, uh, just, you know, I love to think about this stuff, but I'm like, ah, I gotta go do this stuff. So, you know, <laughs> that's why I can't claim to be the sea turtle expert, and I certainly am not a herpetologist. But I think some of this growth stuff is really interesting. Whether they're, if they're really, yeah, I'd say this. It could be just increased experience, but uh, a hawk's bill is hard to measure over time because their scoots wear down. So they can take these lengths, but you might be missing some growth. Now, I didn't have a, there is a, I have a trajectory of the measured growth of these leatherbacks, and there is a slight increase over time. What that means and how it translates into what energy they would be putting into that versus coming back. Now, one thing that's nice about these models versus the usual way people do stuff. What's the observed re-migration interval? Those are nice statistics for indices, but they don't get into feeding right into a population model. So some of these probability-based models, then it, you can pick up on some of the subtleties. So you mentioned that the leatherback detection was uh, lower prob detection probability than the hawksbill, but it's a bigger turtle. <laughs> Do you think that difference is just the quality of the survey approach itself or differences in habitat or behavior that make it harder to... No, uh, that's a good question. I think it's, uh, they'll go to Calabra for one of their clutches, right? So the, um, the detection probability up there is the product of availability within season in detection. So the turtle comes to the same point, but she might not come every time. And so there's an availability process there. Okay. So because I, I think they, yeah, those are the questions I always ask. But so there's less fidelity to the site. Them. And the hospital doesn't. They might go to a different beach at that, you know, 
CEO of that company won't you go on that night. But you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's why if you have that direct take the actual number of nests, if that's reliable, mm -hmm. you know it's a fresh delayed nest. Uh, and you know how many you caught, you can integrate those data sources. Time for one more. Let's thank Bill one more time. Thank you, Bill.